In the grand scheme of human history, the United States of America is an incredibly new country. From its culture and the scale of its military and economic might, the US has been influential since its inception. In the span of just two centuries, it went from a disunified band of colonies into the strongest power that has ever been seen. Even by its creation, the United States drastically changed the course of history. So, as a thought exercise, what if it didn't exist? What if, in an alternate timeline, the United States of America never existed? Opens up a lot of questions, doesn't it? For this alternate timeline, let's go back to the 1770s, the American Revolution, as tension grew between the colonies and the British. In this alternate scenario, war begins. The American rebels fight against the British regulars. There were many numerous occasions the US could have been defeated. All it simply took was not having the aid of one foreign ally, an ally who would love to get back at the British. Yes, that's right, the French. The French involvement in the American Revolution saved the rebellion and without it, the militia surely would have lost. And this wasn't a small contribution. The French involvement meant funding to rebels, supplies, guns, men, and ships, particularly to distract the British naval fleet. And France wanted revenge so badly, they put themselves in massive debt just to aid the Americans. This would come back to haunt them later, I'll talk about that soon. Say in this alternate scenario, France is more fiscally responsible, and realize they can't win a war without tanking their finances and the U.S. is left out to dry. After years of holding out against Native American, British, and German regulars, it's just too much. So, the rebellion crumbles. The British seize control, and most of the Continental Congress goes into exile or are arrested. Perhaps negotiations occur between the two to make amends, but this is hard to predict. In this alternate timeline, the revolution is crushed, and the experiment that was the United States of America is in the history books, a failed rebellion over anger with the British Parliament. It can't be left unsaid that there is still bitterness among a sizable portion of the colonial population. There's still this culture within the colonies that resent the loss. While the war ends and a majority of American colonists simply move on with their lives, there's still a mentality similar to the South will rise again. The relationship between the two is forever changed. The 13 colonies were already kind of different from the rest of the British realms, but now going into the 1790s and the 19th century, it would be painted as the rogue colony which still has an independent tendency. There are immediate changes that result from the US not existing. When the US won the revolution, in the Treaty of Paris it was given all of the land east of the Mississippi River. In this alternate scenario, the 13 colonies simply remain the 13 colonies. This changes multiple things, including the path of the British imperial ambitions and the politics of North America as a whole. Let's talk relationships. In this alternate timeline, the American colonists don't have the best relationship with their neighbors. Catholic French Quebec is to the north and would be despised by the deeply Puritan colonists. And the numerous Native Americans to the west would be an issue as well, except for a few tribes, but I'll discuss that later. In our timeline, when the US was born, Quebec was pushed up to where it is today, and the natives were under American control. But with control of this land under the British Parliament, American colonists are sort of stuck on the coast. In this scenario, Canada, as we think of it, simply doesn't exist. What eventually became Canada had a large population boost after the war, from loyalists who fled the independent United States. It's said that these loyalists were the initial boost that brought Canada as a territory for Britain, being happy to be under the king's rule and all. But without independence, these loyalists stay in the colonies, so Canada doesn't have an influx of English-speaking Brits. But you know what it does have? French Canadians. This land was once under the control of the French in something known as New France, but France lost this land after the Seven Years' War. French colonists were allowed to stay and keep their culture as long as they stayed loyal to the British king. Thus, Quebec was born. In this alternate scenario, Quebec never loses this land and stays incredibly large, one that takes up all of the Great Lakes, the Ohio River, and goes up into the northern seas of the Atlantic. Had Quebec continued to be allowed to rule these lands, the Midwest and the Great Lakes are French-speaking, deeply Catholic territories. But there is a third culture as well. Most of the land south of the Ohio River is entirely populated by Native American tribes. If the treaty with the natives continued, then the British protect Native land rights in the Deep South. Inside this territory was what was known as the Five Civilized Tribes by the Americans, the Creek, 
Choctaw, Cherokee, Chickasaw, and Seminole. They were called this because of their general acceptance of many colonial practices into their society. And the colonists held by comparison pretty good views of the natives as well, in comparison to other minorities. It was often thought that if the native tribes simply adopted European culture, they'd be on equal footing with the colonists. As decades go by in this alternate timeline, interaction with British Americans and the Quebec Canadians slowly alter these five tribal societies into adapting more European practices. Not much can be said other than the native tribes of the South remain prominent members who may eventually adopt colonial ways. Who knows? It's commonly taught in school that the American Revolution had an immediate impact throughout the world. And that's true, just not in the way we think. Remember when I said France was a key ally to the American rebels? That aid required money. That money had to come from somewhere, and the French monarchy didn't have it. The monarchy put itself into a large amount of debt. This debt created a financial crisis, and without getting into too many details, this was the crisis which led to the chain of events that eventually brought down the monarchy, led to the French Revolution, and eventually... Napoleon. In this alternate timeline, Britain crushes the American rebels, since France doesn't get involved. Sure, the French monarchy is still in debt, but without this financial crisis, because no war, they can kick that can down the road by at least a few decades. By doing so, Napoleon's opportunity to seize power doesn't happen. The Napoleonic Wars never occur. The Holy Roman Empire is not obliterated by the French invasion and hundreds of little German states aren't reorganized into 30 with the Confederation of the Rhine. There is never a rise of Prussia, and so the German Empire is never formed. It can't be underestimated how much Napoleon not coming to power affected global history, as Napoleon's forces invaded Spain and Portugal, bringing their colonies into chaos. In this alternate timeline, without the United States, there is no immediate military catastrophe to weaken these empires. They remain prominent and powerful. Throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, the New World is still prime real estate for European colonization. The British and Spanish are pretty much the only ones left, with the Russians in Alaska. Which leaves New Spain in the question. It's doubtful the Spanish would have risked war over the territory if the British wanted it enough. The British expand slowly across the North American continent. However, what changes is how they interact with the native tribes instead of the Americans. Manifest Destiny was a uniquely American ideal that wouldn't exist in this alternate timeline. Instead, it's likely the British would interact with the native tribes and give them autonomy, essentially splitting North America up into native-dominated provinces in the West with white colonists. This is the undoubtable effect of the United States losing the revolution and not existing. The transformation of British imperial policy around the world. Think of it like soul-searching, but with warships. Losing the United States ended the first empire, and the British funded exploration ships to go find new lands to settle. This led to the discovery of Australia and New Zealand. It also lent to the British to become more invested in conquering lands in Africa and all of India. With North America, though, Britain simply invests in this massive territory of land. As industrialization arrives, the British banned slavery and the slave trade as a whole. This would create extreme unrest in the United States. But the British still banned slavery, and the issue is finished by the 1830s. The British have access to the bountiful amounts of oil, natural gas, and coal left untapped in North America. The change here is the balance in power in the world. Not only that, but the balance of power in Europe. Germany remains divided for the entire 19th century, meaning World War I and World War II never occur. Yet some alternate war probably would happen. As for North America, the British Dominion of North America is a diverse land. The 13 colonies still exist, and are culturally different from the rest of the continent. Native Americans make up a predominant section of Western North America, while white colonists dominate the Western coast. This is, however, simply one scenario. We'll never truly know what will happen. This is just one thought exercise. The United States has always been a land where people from around the world have came to create a new life. And since I'm here, and I have a life, that means that at some point in history, my ancestors had to have gotten on that boat, or flew as I like to imagine, and just stayed in the United States until generations later, I was born. I've always kind of wondered where my ancestors came from, so in sponsorship with Ancestry, I actually found out. Now for reference, my entire family has absolutely no idea where we came from. It was never discussed, and the furthest back I can trace my roots is Buffalo, New York. 
Since my last name is Franklin, I suspected maybe I had ties to Britain, but it was never really sure. Also, my skin was so pale, I thought maybe there was some Northern European DNA in there too. Without either side knowing where we came from, I decided to take a test for myself, and just in time, Ancestry contacted me. They have a service called Ancestry DNA. They mailed me a box, I spit in a tube, and then sent it into a lab. Using their DNA cross-referencing and gene comparisons, Ancestry DNA was actually able to pinpoint using my DNA where my ancestors had actually come from, or at least the general area. Basically comparing my genes to the similar genes of ethnic groups from around the world, and the results were pretty surprising. According to the test, I have 36% British ancestry, most likely from England. So the last name actually makes sense. The next was pretty surprising, 30% Scandinavian, particularly Norway or Sweden. Huh. Being from the Midwest, I thought maybe German, but nope. No German genes, just Scandinavian. The next highest was 20% Irish, and then a random 7% from Italy and Greece, somewhere in the Mediterranean. The 7% actually makes sense because for some reason my brother looks something like this. Maybe he got more of those genes. And then there's assorted genes from the rest of Europe and even 2% Jewish, 1% Middle Eastern. So there must have been an interesting story in there somewhere. The oddest thing is that I thought when I'd find out I'd feel different somehow. I don't know. But to be honest, maybe it's just from having my own suspicions for this entire time, but I don't really feel different at all. Yeah, I may have ancestors from this certain place, but I'm 100% American. I lived in Ohio my entire life. I like football, stars and stripes, that sort of thing. Also, I had a friend who started loving a certain country way too much once he found out he had heritage from it, so I'm not gonna go down that path. But learning about where your ancestors came from does tell a fascinating story, and it can be quite an experience. Honestly, I suggest you give it a try. We're in an age now where you can find out your history just from spitting in a tube, so why not try it out? Ancestry DNA is an international service available in 30 or so markets, so really anybody can use it, not just Americans. Discover details about your unique family history and go to Ancestry.com slash althistory or click on the link in the description to get a 10% discount. If you find anything out, then tweet using the hashtag MyAncestry. This is Cody of Alternate History Hub.